Commencement, the Beginning of a New Era in Higher Education by Kate Colbert and Joe Salustio with contributions by Elvin Freitas is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Get your Kindle edition or your softbound book. It's going to be amazing. Fierce Education targets higher education leaders, administrators, and faculty, and those driving technology adoption decisions in this new blended learning world. Go to www.fierceeducation.com for all the latest news, tips, and successful case studies of what higher education institutions are doing to better student engagement, ensure equal access, and improve the assessment process. That's www.fierceeducation.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to edit up on the Edup Experience podcast, where we make education your business. Dr. Joe Salustio, back with you again for the 500 and somethingth time. I'll continue to come back and do it uh, because, as you, as you as you have seen, that's I make so many mistakes. I just keep them in. I don't edit them. But as you know. Elvin has booked me out until now the end of February. Every time I get on this episode, there is one more month tacked on the end uh, where I podcast literally every single day at lunch, except for Christmas Day, New Year's Day, Thanksgiving Day. I'm taking those days off. Maybe I'll take a vacation eventually, but I got to tell you, my, my co-founder, Elvin Freitas, uh, has prevented me and forbid me, forbade me, in fact, from taking the vacation. We're going to have to talk about that, Elvin, uh, coming up. Of course, I can't take a vacation because you all know that we're writing a book called Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education. Basically, um, we're writing it with 100 plus co-authors. And who are they? They're the 100 plus college and university presidents, the first 100 that we interviewed. We're taking all their insights, all their fears and successes, and we're putting them into a book along with my co-author, Kate Colbert. It's uh, available on Amazon, self-plugging here, um, my own book. Uh, it is my my podcast, so I can do that, I guess, without it sounding too terrible. But I do have a guest here today that I want to get to, a very important guest, in fact, um, that's doing some great things and has done great things in higher education for uh, at this particular organization for now, I think, uh, uh, going on in like 15 years or so. Um, but before I get to him, I do want to bring in my guest co-host. You've heard him before, ladies and gentlemen. You'll hear him again. Um, because now that I gave him an open invitation, he keeps coming back. Here he is. He's Douglas Carl, uh, Carlson. He's head of business development and partnerships for North America at Lead Squared. Douglas, I was so um, specific that I need to get your title right. I messed up your last name, but that's how it goes here. <laughs> Quite all right. You know, Carlson, it works just fine. And, uh, you know, thanks for letting me uh, continue to walk in the door here. You should just lock it and I won't, won't escape. <laughs> yeah, but I give you a key, so that's not working very good. Sure. So, you know, that, that, but but I, you know what? We're going to get better and better as we do this, Douglas. And I, I love having you on, man, because you've got a great background and insights and in, in your role at Lead Squared and working with colleges and universities across the United States. So you've got a lot of great insight. You are in Denver, in fact, my old stomping ground. Is that correct? Are you in Denver right now? It is, you know, uh, over 300 days of sunshine a year. It's not about bad life. Uh, you know what? You're getting really good at plugging things that you like too on this podcast. I <laughs> Am I that transparent? <laughs> yeah, no, no, not at all. But but you're doing a good job, and it, and it sounds very natural when you do do it. So well done, um, Douglas. I'm really excited for our guest today. Um, he is, uh, like I said, they've been doing. Him and his colleagues have been doing great work in higher education for many years. Let me bring him in now. Here he is. He is Dr. Fardad Fateri, and he's president and CEO of International Education Corporation. Fardad, how are you? Well, thank you very much. Uh, how are you, Joe? And Douglas? You know, I'm living the dream, except I'm not in California where you are. So, you know, I'm living the St. Louis dream over here. How are, how are things out there in Cali? Good, very well. Uh, we enjoy the same number of uh, sunny days here in Southern California. Uh, without the winter. Yes, uh, without the winter. So we do miss the four seasons from time to time. Well, you know what, uh, you know, it, it, it is, uh, Denver is a nice place, I have to say. And uh, I will, I will tell you that where I live now in St. Charles, Missouri is also very nice. You get to, you get the four seasons, you definitely get a fall season, which is my favorite. And we're getting ready for our um, division one football games we have here at this university. And, um, and you know, that's uh, the, the reason I bring that up is because that is one particular way to experience higher education the traditional path, as it were. Lindenwood University has a traditional path for students, the 18 year olds are coming, they're watching football and so on. Um, but International Education Corporation, 
uh, does things a little bit different, in fact. And so I, I thought you might just lay the groundwork for us. What is IEC? What is it comprised? What comprises IEC? What do you guys do and how do you do it? Yeah, IEC is a holding organization. Uh, we have uh, multiple brands that we own and operate. Uh, one of them is uh, Florida Career College. Uh, one is UEI, UEI College. Uh, one is United Education Institute. Uh, we also have two uh, uh, other systems that offer even shorter term programs. One is Sage Truck Driving School and one is U.S. colleges. So the first three I mentioned, United Education Institute, UEI College, and Florida Career College offer uh, eight to 10 month programs in high demand, uh, career focused uh, uh, programs like uh, uh, programs in healthcare, skilled trades, business, criminal justice, and uh, we the and sage truck driving school and u.s colleges offer even short term shorter term programs for six four weeks six week and two month programs uh, uh in emt and uh, truck driving and and programs within within that time frame so preparing students in all areas for uh, entry-level positions in high demand verticals within the marketplace. Amazing. I love it because um, career colleges fill a very important role in the US higher education system. And it's becoming even more important as we see, um, I think adults looking for a skill development and get me into the workforce as fast as humanly possible. Let me make some money. Let me figure out what I'm gonna do after that, whether I'm gonna stick in the job that I have or I wanna go back to school. But I might career change. I might switch my career at 45. And, and those things didn't used to happen 10, 20, 30 years ago, and they're happening now. As a result of the pandemic, they're happening even faster sometimes. What's demand been looking like and how have your programs filled a particular need? Yeah, demand ha has been consistent for us uh, because of the spaces uh, this, this we, we occupy, uh, healthcare, skilled trades, and some are cyclical, some are counter cyclical. Um, when, when the economy uh, is, is on the rise and uh, the, the, the cyclical programs like skilled trades do well, and when the economy retracts, uh, other programs like the ones in healthcare um, start uh, uh, growing. So overall, demand has been very, very consistent. Uh, not not just because of the economy, but uh, like you referenced, also because of, of, of students and and their choices now uh, versus before. You know, uh, twenty years ago, everybody wanted to go to school and get a degree. Um, you know, bachelor's, master's, doctoral degrees. That's what I did uh, because I thought that is the only path uh, to secure employment. Uh, but, but, but lately, uh, students are, are focused more on competency-based education. Uh, they want to uh, become proficient uh, in, in specific skills so they can secure employment. And that has a lot to do with employer uh, demand and employer behavior. Um, in the past, employers uh, would want a bachelor's degree or a master's degree to look at candidates. I know as an employer, I used to focus a lot on academic uh, background. Uh, but today, a lot of employers uh, look for skills. They look for proficiencies and mastery in specific areas and not necessarily degrees. They want, even if you have a bachelor's degree, uh, they want to know if you have uh, 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 skills and proficiencies in specific areas where they have significant need. I mean, I'm sure you've heard companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, they have their own training programs because post-secondary education in America has failed them, right? So, so they are now developing their own uh, uh, people cap capability uh, because of the, 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 the need and, and the gap in post-secondary education. 
Douglas, I know you want to come in. Uh, do you have any questions, Douglas? I don't know if you do. You must. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, and, and Fardad, it was like such an interesting point that you're both have programs that are cyclical and counter cyclical. So I'm actually wondering if that just kind of balances you out, doesn't matter where you are in the economy, or do you kind of look ahead at your crystal ball and see, hey, it's a little bit choppy right now. Uh, we expect our counter cyclical programs to grow. Therefore, we're planning on growth. Or just how do you, I guess, how do you think about that? And are you just are naturally positioned to kind of stay steady because of the cyclical and counter cyclical cycle of the different programs? Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Well, we look at demand and, and um, you know, and for example, right now within skilled trades like uh, uh, electrical technician, that program is, is uh, purely uh, cyclical. So uh, when, when the economy is growing, that program, the demand for that program is very, very high. And um, but they're, they're, but HVAC uh, heating, uh, ventilation, and air conditioning that program always does well uh, because there is always need and demand for that type of uh, skill, and and healthcare programs like medical assistant, pharmacy technician, uh, patient care technician, dental assistant, those programs are more more counter cyclical, uh, just simply uh, because people go back to school uh, to either shift careers or secure uh, new employment uh, because of because of the economy uh, and the retraction in the economy. Got it. Well, and I'm also curious, we, we've talked about a, a couple different things about sort of non-traditional students. So I'm, I'm curious if your population reflects this stat, but you know, if you go to newamerica.org, just if anyone's actually trying to validate the stats, um, most Americans, about 63%, believe that the average college student is 20 years old, which is actually not true. The average age of a college student is 26.4 years, not that yeah. the 0.4 makes any difference. Right. Does that reflect your students or your population, or is it just kind of a wide range? Uh, no, our average are, is, is between 26 to 28 years old uh, as uh, well. Uh, you know, uh, you know, historically, we used to call that group non-traditional, but I think that is the traditional student yeah. today. Uh, it's Thank no longer non-traditional. Yes. Well, and I'm also, also curious, like, what's the profile of someone that, that you're enrolling, that you're educating? Is, are, they coming, are they coming back after trying school? Have they been in the job market a little while and they want to shift? And maybe it's all the above, but just really curious about who you serve. Yeah, you know, it's, it's several groups. One um, are students who've been in other professions yep. um, and, and want to shift careers. Uh, you know, that's one. The other one are a group of students who've tried community colleges. Uh, they've taken a course or two and they just couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, with 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 uh, with career oriented programs, and and then we have students who have low household incomes. They've never worked before. They've never gone to school before. They haven't done well academically, and they're looking for a path uh, and an opportunity for them to be able to learn specific skills in a in a safe. Uh, secure um, and, and friendly and student oriented uh, community uh, to, to help them learn and secure employment afterwards. So the, all of them have the same, all of our students have the same ambition in that they want short term uh, and, and they don't mind starting at the bottom entry level and entering professions uh, that they're unfamiliar with uh, but but their backgrounds are are different. Got it. Interesting. And, and Joe, if I, if I may, just ask one more question. I know you want to jump in with yours as well. But yeah, you can take um, over the podcast anytime you want, Douglas. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> so I'm curious. Ah! <laughs> uh, so I'm curious with IEC. When I was looking through your programs, mo it looks like you're mostly, if not all, focused on ground base. One, correct me if if you have a big online program that I missed. But two, if I haven't. 
Is there a reason why you've gone with the strategy of a more ground-based approach versus really driving into the online space? Yeah, you know, uh, we were 100% on ground okay. before COVID. And, and when COVID hit, uh, we decided to go hybrid. We've, we've, been, we've been researching hybrid training and hybrid education for years before COVID, but COVID in a way pushed us into a new mode of delivering content uh, in a different way. Um, and, and so what we've done with hybrid is we, we, we have uh, developed an L, a learning management system. So we have our, all of our theory and lectures uh, delivered virtually um, uh, through our LMS. And then we have all of our hands-on components within our, our oh. curricula that's that are offered uh, through our labs on campus so students come to school two days a week for all of our hands on practitioner oriented uh, lab focused uh, uh, training and then they will they do all all the theory. Um, uh, on uh, virtually uh, through our LMS so all of our programs are offered now through a hybrid mode where there is a mix between uh, the theory and the lecture and, and the on-campus, on-ground, uh, hands-on component. We have one program that's fully online, uh, and, and, and that's our, uh, we have a, a diploma program in medical billing and coding. Uh, that's 100% online. It's a relatively, it's a pilot program. We just started it uh, several months ago. Uh, but it's out. We're, we're trying to learn um, how to do that effectively. Again, our, our philosophy is we want students to, uh, to, to master uh, the, the learning objectives of each program, the terminal learning objectives of each program, um, so the employers um, can, can benefit from their skills. Uh, and, and we want to be sure whether the content is delivered fully online or in the hybrid format, the students have the same experience and they, they, they have the same learnings um, so that employers uh, would still recruit them and hire them. For us, I mean, the greatest accountability is not only to graduate our students, but it's, it's also to place them. So if employers are not going to hire our graduates, our job is not done right. So, so for us, uh, uh, the, the employability and the gainful employment of our students is critical to our success because that's how we are measured. Um, so it's, it's not one of those types of uh, programs that you can finish and by finishing you're done. We're not done until students uh, secure employment in academically related uh, entry level professions. Fierce Education is the place where higher education leaders, administrators, and faculty, and those driving technology adoption decisions in education can access proven methods and best practices as they rethink pedagogy and business models in the new blended learning world. Through its website, www.fierceeducation.com, virtual events and newsletters, Fierce Education focuses on rethinking higher education in a blended learning world. Fierce Education's key tenants are to use technology for teaching better and reaching learners everywhere, addressing business model changes required to move forward, and workforce preparation for adult learners who are out to reskill. That's www.fierceeducation.com. That's an important point, and I, 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 I've talked about this before as, as we've had different guests on from different sectors of, of higher ed. In the career college sector specifically, it's very heavily and unfairly regulated in my opinion um you know so you think if you're if you're working for a nonprofit institution big institution and you're you know finishing off students and you're handing them a degree and you're saying good luck to you on your path towards a new job mm -hmm. um many of the institutions in the career college sector that's when the, the work begins it's like you got to find this mm -hmm. student meaningful work to a certain percentage of your graduates in order to be able to continue that program 
um, or else, and there's lots that goes into it. So there's another infrastructure that career colleges have to create in career services that simply just does not exist in uh, other areas of higher education. That means more overhead, more fixed costs, um, but sometimes really, really, and most of the time, really, really good outcomes because you can tie your outcomes to jobs and money and mm -hmm. produce a more clear, more clarity around an ROI. Would you say that would be true for First of all, the regula regulation piece, and second of all, the, the ROI piece. Yeah, um, addressing your first point about uh, regulatory oversight, I, I, I am I am an academic. I'm an educator. That's how I started uh, uh, my profession. Uh, so I'm a big, big, big proponent of of academic quality and uh, educational integrity. So, so I am overall in favor of regulatory oversight, be it state institutional accreditation or federal. Uh, now, with that said, I also believe uh, uh, regulatory oversight uh, should uh, should uh, transcend uh, the tax status of an organization uh, and, and apply to any post-secondary entity, whether they are tax paying or non-tax paying. Um, uh, in the United States, as you know, the regulatory, the regulations and the laws that provide oversight for tax paying schools are, are uh, far more stringent than non tax paying schools. Uh, and, and there are many examples of that, and I'm sure uh, the two of you are aware of those. My, my personal feeling is uh, if students in the tax paying sector, like ours, uh, uh, deserve consumer protection, so do students in non tax paying schools. Why shouldn't uh, students uh, in non-tax uh, schools. I just want to hit the attention button because it's so important what you're saying. Yeah, why shouldn't students in non-tax paying schools not have access to the same protection rights as tax paying schools? And then that's where you know we get into the discussion of um, uh, regulatory oversight and the politics of higher education. Uh, but but I am all for regulation, and to me from a business standpoint, regulations are excellent. It's a barrier to entry for me, right? The more regulations that, that are out there, the better. That means that we won't have everybody opening up a school in the corner. But I do believe uh, that regardless of tax status, regulations should apply to every program, every school, uh, every university uh, in America. And, 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 I, and I, you know, that's a position of held my entire professional life, even when I worked um, at, at public nonprofits out there. So uh, I, I think regulations in general are good, uh, but they need to be uniform, they need to be standardized, they need to be consistent uh, uh, within all of post-secondary education, regardless of tax status. Uh, so that's my, my, my opinion about uh, regulatory oversight. I also believe uh, Regulators um, need to be fair, they need to be reasonable, uh, and they need to provide proper due process regardless of tax status. So we are not always like uh, paranoid and anxious depending on who's the secretary of education, who's in office and who's not. I don't wanna run my business based on who's in office, but based on what students think. Uh, I am an educator. I, I don't want to worry about, uh, you know, who, who the political appointees are. I want to worry about how to serve my students. And, and, and because of things are, the, the way things are, we spend way too much time mm -hmm. on, 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 on things that don't matter to, to student rights, student protection, student achievement, and student learning. And, and student outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that, that has been an emerging outcome of, of the, the ecosystem within post-secondary education. Now, going to the ROI part, um, I think uh, that, uh, that, that career training and career education is a necessary component of post-secondary education. I am, I, I am also one of those that believes there is a need for community colleges 
There is a need for state colleges, universities, undergraduate, uh, uh, postgraduate uh, programs. There is a need for all of that. Um, and, and, and I do believe uh, that every segment of, of this continuum provides significant value uh, to, to the marketplace and to the economy. Um, and, and so I, I am not one of those that advocates for either or, uh, but everybody needs to better understand their role within the space they occupy. Uh, you won't ever see us uh, start offering programs that are not consistent with our thesis of having short-term programs, preparing students for entry-level jobs. Uh, I, I think uh, within this continuum uh, in the American higher education system, there has been a lot of crossover of, of school companies. And, and I think that's where it gets a little gooey and messy. And so everybody just needs to stay within their lane and, and, and do what they're good at. So our core competency uh, here is, is to offer short-term programs uh, in high demand verticals, preparing students for entry-level jobs. We are not good at anything else. So, so kind of ex being humble and accepting your limitations, I, I think is very, very important uh, in, in being a, a contributor uh, to, to student learning and, and, and to the employers out there. And I think that's where the ROI uh, becomes a key question is, if, are you doing what you said you're going to do? And are you doing it effectively? I mean, that's the, that's the, the two questions that, that have to drive decision making uh, within every school. And for, for certain, that's what drives us. Uh, Let me ask one more quick one, Douglas, and I'll hand it over to you and you can <clears throat> run home with it. Uh, uh, but Fardad, one of the hard things, if, if um, universities, especially traditional ones, work on a traditional semester-based system, mm -hmm. and, um, and many career colleges for years and years and years have, have worked in non-standard term, which mm -hmm. is a federal definition, but, but off schedule, if you want to say it that way, with mm -hmm. multiple entry points, with a faster replication schedule, with more intrusive, warm retention services and, and uh, student services, uh, that replication schedule is very hard for people who are not used to it to understand and get their arms around. How do you, how do you register a student? How do you run SAP? How do you put grades in? I mean, you, you put grades in in two days? That's impossible. You can't do that. You can't, you know, you guys have been running at your uh, various uh, organizations with an IEC and a very fast replication schedule mm -hmm. in terms of in entry points. Can you mm -hmm. talk about that? W what what it takes organizationally to do that? Because it is a, a vision based, you know, you've got to get everybody moving in the same speed. And that's a big differentiator speed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what does that look like? And how do you how do you if you're if you're somebody that doesn't understand that? What do you what is that like? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And, and, and um, uh, I can tell you, I mean, all of you, I mean, you don't have to be in higher education to know that many, many smaller nonprofit private universities have been shutting down in the last 10 years, uh, simply because they wouldn't want to give up on the way they're scheduled, the way they're organized, the way they run their faculty, uh, the way they run their staff, the, the way they hold classes. Um, so, uh, and, and I think that will continue, that trend will continue uh, to persist because I believe uh, students may have been fine with that type of a model in the past, but students today, I mean, this is the digital, uh, 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 Gen Y and, and, and Z and the mil new millennials we are dealing with, uh, they make decisions now. They want to take action now. They want things, they want to learn the, the way they learn, not the way the school wants you to learn. Um, so, I mean, we, we see that not only in post-secondary education, we see that in their consumer behavior, the way they buy, uh, the way they eat, what they eat, where they shop. Um, students today have different uh, demands and 
schools, post-secondary schools that want to persist and do well and remain uh, relevant will have to adjust uh, to the way students uh, uh, want to learn and how to, they want to learn. I mean, we have Google. I mean, for all practical purposes, uh, you know, you can't teach history the way you used to 20 years ago, because students can go online on Google and learn about history. So how are you going to deliver content in a, within a history discipline that's relevant and would excite your students to actually come to, to school, whether it's virtual or whether it's on ground. So being able to schedule classes in a way that provides urgency and convenience and timeliness and relevance is going to be critical uh, to, to the success of schools. And, and I tell you what I'm telling you, this sounds logical, but a lot of colleges and universities do not like it because they think it's impossible to organize yourselves, to organize themselves in a monthly type start format. They don't want to design curricula uh, in a way that accommodates the students. But uh, philosophically, uh, the way I think about it is, is not what I think is right, what our faculty think is right, or what our staff think it's right. It's what students want. So if students, everybody says it, but very few people are organized this way. If we put students at the core of what you do, how you think, how you organize yourselves, then you can truly create the appropriate infrastructure to accommodate that student. So that's truly being student centric, uh, right? I mean, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's not for us to say what students need. Students will tell you what they need. We just have to give it to them. We just have to provide them with what they need, how they want to learn. But what our thing is, we need to, we need to know what employers want, uh, what the trends are, and deliver appropriate content, but deliver it the way the students will learn. Mm. Douglas, over, I, I couldn't have said it better. Yeah, well and, and if uh, if I'm taking it home here, I think the the question I have, and and you think you've answered this over the the interview here, but if you had a couple takeaways for for higher education on lessons that they can learn, or maybe you can help pass on from uh, kind of a faster moving process, you know, what are the things that you would point out to higher education institutions that would be worth them considering learning, or kind of a takeaway yeah. from your experience? Yeah, um, you know, honestly, I'm a learner. I learn every day. Uh, every day I'm trying to figure out how to persist, how to get better, how to improve. Uh, you know, and, and, and I talk to so many people in higher education all the time and everybody's saying, well, you're competing with me. I'm competing with you. Community colleges say you're taking our students. Four-year universities are saying you're taking my students. My point what is- What the heck is going on? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, know, you know, my point is we're not competing with one another anymore. I am not worried about the community colleges. I'm not worried about the four-year universities. I'm worried about Amazon, Google, Facebook, Tesla. They are our competition because we are doing a lousy job preparing America's next generation of America's workers. If we are doing a lousy job, the American companies are going to take over training students. 100%. Uh, you know, so, so I am most worried. I'm not worried about the, my peer uh, career college next door. Everybody who asks me, who are your competitors? I say the employers. If when employers stop hiring our grads, when they start developing their own training uh, uh, programs, when they start opening their own colleges, you know, a lot of companies are doing that, then there, we, are, we become irrelevant, we become obsolete. And I, I'm sad to say it's trending that way. I mean, the, the greatest fear, fear in higher education is not taking students from one another within the ecosystem, but from outside of the ecosystem. 
uh, with, with employers becoming, because they're getting so much better, they are hiring some of the best talent in our sector uh, to go there and set up shop to deliver content that's timely and relevant and fast, right? I mean, so uh, that's, that, I mean, this is, I mean, this is what I see. I, I may be a little paranoid, but I see uh, that trend uh, continuing to persist and, and unless higher education is willing to transform itself, not change, but transform itself so it becomes more relevant and so it becomes something that our students want, right? So that's, that, that would be my, 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 my earth shattering message. <laughs> Pretty darn good. Yeah, no kidding. Go ahead, Douglas Gadnall. I think, well, and let, let's sum it up with something, uh, you know, a little, uh, maybe perhaps a little wider. Um, I'm curious on the future programs that you're excited about. So for instance, you know, are, are you going to start offering um, electric car maintenance or just like with the new jobs and new companies that are out there, sort of to name the Teslas and Googles of the world? Um, are there programs that you're seeing come down the pipe that are maybe interesting, exciting, new, um, or, is, or is what you have as an offering uh, really what the what the market needs. So I'm just curious on that end. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Right now, I, I think we are offering what the market needs. Uh, we auto we offer an auto uh, automotive technician program that's that we have the electric component, but we're adding more and more to the to the curriculum that's more uh, focused on electric cars uh, all the time because of more and more uh, electric cars uh, being driven out there. So that's you happening. I hear that a lot with like the, the, the car, you know, and kind of mechanic or car maintenance is basically like a technology program now, yeah. you know, they're, they're using iPads and pictures and, you know, they're, they're not, uh, the nuts and the bolts is the end of the job. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's exactly, I mean, so that's a, that, that's transitionary, but, but, but the, 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 the programs we're looking into, um, uh, believe it or not, uh, you know, we are looking into, uh, it wouldn't surprise you that we're looking into programs to prepare students uh, for uh, green, green businesses. Yep. Uh, I mean, the demand has been limited, uh, but we're definitely trying to capture employer demand for uh, graduates who have special competencies in entering the workforce for green technology. Um, the other area we're looking at are drones, drone pilots. Oh yeah. And yeah, and, and that's becoming a, a, a huge skill for a lot of employers. It's, it's starting to take off in a, in a very disciplined and structured way. Uh, so that's an area we're also exploring. Farhad, let me ask you just a quick follow-up on that. The employers tell you, right? They, they must come to you and go, Hey, you know yeah. what? Do you got you have any drone maintenance technicians or something? Yeah. Do you keep your staff? And I, I think the answer is probably yes. But how do you keep your staff on the dime so that they can go? Oh, employers said they need this. We're gonna whip this up. Like you, you must have some ready tiger team or you know meetings and regular response to the employers. Yeah, yeah, we we uh, spend a lot of time with employers, not just employers who hire our graduates, but overall employers uh, out there. And we don't necessarily want to get anecdotal information, but we want uh, uh, evidence of, of of a large movement towards certain professions. Um, I I tell everybody we are a pure career training school. Uh, so we are not like automotive or skilled trades or healthcare. Uh, if underwater basket weaving becomes a very popular employment uh, opportunity in the workplace, we will offer an eight-month underwater basket weaving program. Uh, will be in line. Yeah, <laughs> and and but but we need to see significant demand within the marketplace for that profession. Uh, employer employer demand is our signal to get into certain programs. We didn't have skilled trades until seven years ago, until out of, uh, based on our research, we found out HVAC is a big area, electrical technician is a big area, automotive is a big area. So, you know, we just look for, for evidence uh, uh, within the employment marketplace 
to to start new programs and and explore our research based on that. Well, we like to ask a final two questions to every single guest, Farda. And what, so far, you've provided an incredible insight to our uh, our listeners. Number one, anything about IEC and your um, uh, member colleges that you'd like to say? Anything that we missed, anything that's important to you as a part of your strategy or vision or mission that you wanna add in, anything at all, your time to plug your your own uh, college as much as you'd like. And then number two, you kind of talked about it a little bit. What do you see as the future of higher education? Um, as far as I see, uh, you know, uh, we are a learning organization. Uh, we, we are not perfect. I always tell everybody we're perfectly imperfect. We're, we are learning all the time. We're trying to get better in everything that we do. Uh, we have great student outcomes. Uh, students are at the core of what we do. Uh, we are an organization uh, uh, of educators. Uh, we, we, we are makeup uh, of senior management and management uh, is our people who come from this industry. They grew up in this industry. We care a lot about students, but we are uh, we, we are work in progress, you know, no matter how much we grow and how well our students do, our student outcomes have improved every year since I've been here in the last 15 years. Uh, and that's something I'm very, very proud of. We still have ways to go. Uh, and, 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 I, and I, I, I think excellence is, is something we strive for. And we will never get to that point of saying we are the best. You'll never hear that from anybody here. Uh, but I, I do believe what we do is important. I do believe it matters. And, and I do believe there is a strong need and a strong demand for, for who we are and what we do. Um, and uh, what was your second question? Uh, uh, well, before I re-ask it, I yeah, do want to say yeah. that you are, all, are also into accountability. If you go to the AEC website, the first thing that it says right in the above the fold is obsessed with student success. And if you're going to say that and put it out there and the first thing you see on a website, you yeah. better be ready to back it up. And, and I appreciate that. that. That says a lot about your organization. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and we mean it. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's an important and accountability is important. We're not storytellers. Uh, we don't have excuses. Uh, we don't point fingers. We take full accountability for, uh, everything that we do, good, bad, or ugly. I like it. And so the second question was, anything you want to add about the future of higher education for all those listening? Yeah, I, I, I in my opinion, uh, uh, American post-secondary education is in trouble. Um, and, 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 I, and I believe, I am very optimistic that it will figure itself out uh, but I, I, I do believe that we need to recognize there is a big problem uh, and, and we need to transform ourselves as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a sector. Uh, and I'm talking about regardless of tax status and, and, and degree or career training, we need to uh, shift and transform ourselves to become more relevant and, and more timely and, and to, to be there for employers as well as our students. Uh, I don't think uh, we should make decisions based on what us operators think. We need to start making decisions based on what employers want, what society needs, and what our students want. And, and so uh, that's that, and I think we will figure it out. Uh, we always do as a country, uh, but this is a, this is a huge problem. Um, that we have and we're in. And, and if we don't make it, either employers will make that decision or worse, the politicians. And, 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 and you know, they'll, either way, if employers do it, they'll probably, they'll probably do it, do a great job. Uh, they'll do the job we're not doing. If politicians do it, it's going to be messed up. I mean, that's the easiest way I can, I can put it. And they will make that decision. We all know that. And I can tell you, there's probably a lot of people on this uh, listening now that would agree with you and yeah. everything that you said there. Um, 
well, I, one thing I agree with is that this has been an incredible podcast episode here of the Edup Experience. Of course, my guest host with the longest title in the business, ladies and gentlemen, here he is. He's Douglas Carlson. He's head of business development partnerships for North America at Leeds Square. Douglas, thank you for coming back yet again, my friend, and crushing it. Always a pleasure. That's all you got? Always a pleasure? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you don't, need to say anything you don't need to say anything else. You're going to be back again probably in the next couple of days, so we're, we're going to figure it out. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, here he is, my guest, our guest, your guest today, Dr. Fardad Terry. He's president and CEO of International Education Corporation. Look him up. Check out the work that you're doing. Fardad, did you have a good EdUp experience today, my friend? It was excellent. Thank you for the thoughtful uh, conversation. I enjoyed meeting both of you virtually and uh, and I enjoyed the conversation a great deal. Thank you. Same here. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just ed upped. Commencement, the beginning of a new era in higher education by Kate Colbert and Joe Salustio with contributions by Elvin Freitas is now available for pre-order on Amazon. Get your Kindle edition or your softbound book, it's going to be amazing.